hope's a funny thing. Hope isn't in the moment. Hope is toward the future. Think about it. Think about the term. And then think about how many times after your favorite hockey team would beat somebody, even the most complete, satisfying victories of this entire season, that you felt hope. Good morning to you. Good Wednesday morning, I'm Dayon Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports, and this is Daily Shot of Penguins. It comes your way bright and early every weekday if you're into football and or baseball. I also offer daily shots of Steelers and Pirates in the same place that you found this. Penguins 4, Hurricanes 1. This happened, and it's not about the score, because, you know, they had a 4 nothing lead on the Avalanche the other day, too. Didn't exactly hold up. This wasn't about the result. This wasn't about the margin because there were a couple empty netters in there. This was about who did what because this performance was driven almost entirely by younger players. If I hadn't seen it with my own eyes, I wouldn't have believed it. But it happened. It really happened. It was Jesse Puglia-Yarvey with a big league. Rister for the ice-breaking goal. Jonathan Gruden with a monster hit. Followed up with a fight. Of course, you have to answer for hitting somebody anymore. Valtteri Pustinen all over the rink. Not something that's easily quantified. Nonetheless, very true. Jack St. Ivany was solid. Like really solid. Like early John Marino solid. Only he's a little bit bigger. And all Drew O'Connor did was eat the puck all over the rink. First on every forecheck, uh, bulldozed his way toward the first of those empty netters. I, I can't say enough for how these kids got the rest of the team going, but don't take it from me. Listen to Alex Nedeljkovic. He had 39 saves and was the game's number one star, and... He was front and center in making sure that everybody else got the credit. Some, some real good positivity and, uh, and and a little bit of excitement and and um, kind of I don't want to say like naive, but like just that they want to play, they want to do well, and and, and when you're young like that, when you haven't played a lot of games in this league, you, you want to succeed and you want to have uh, and show the guys around you that you can do it. So they're always, you know, one of the hardest working guys usually when they can get on the ice. And I thought all of them today we did a great job. Uh, Jack was awesome coming back for pucks, talking to me a lot, and. Um, you know, that goes a long way in making things easier. And, and Sammy and Groods, obviously Groods with the fight there, setting the tone. Um, and, and Sammy, too, they, they were doing the little things, like I said. They were the guys, too, that were doing little things and, and helping us have success. I love the phrasing he used there. Did you pick up on the early part when he said that the the kids are naive and that they're just worried? You know what he's saying there, right? You figured that out? Yeah. Well, for anybody who, who didn't, what he's getting at is the younger players were never going to get caught up in any Jake Gensel drama. It didn't mean all that much to them. They're trying to survive. They're trying to stay in the league or they're trying to find a foothold in the league. And whether or not Jake was traded a couple weeks ago or Jake came back for his big return last, it it doesn't affect them. They're just going to go and play And by nature, they're going to play really hard. Now, I say that, and none of it should take away from the fact that the Penguins were more physical. Can't believe this stuff I'm saying today. They were tougher, and they were faster than Carolina. I don't think that would happen if they played 10 more times. But as Herb Brooks once said, it happened this one time. They were undeniably the faster team. On this particular night, and that again points back to the young players. So why would this bring about hope? Well, I guess there's a couple of different ways you can look at it. One is the obvious, is that if you have young players and they're performing, then they can be part of what you're doing for years to come, in theory. That's always a hopeful scenario. The other way, and excuse me a little bit of self-indulgence here, But I'm the one who's been saying since last summer that the way this team needed to be both built and coached 
was with younger players filling roll spots, filling out your bottom six forwards within reason, giving you some legs on the back end. And of course, none of that happened. Kyle Dubas got none of that done. None of it. Added a bunch of 30-year-olds, a bunch of Nola Charis and Matt Niedos to a group that was already a bunch of 30-year-old guys. That was never going to work. That was always the greatest gamble going in. How that wasn't foreseen by people who are professionals, I have no idea, but it wasn't. Secondly, and I see these two things as being equal, Mike Sullivan still, I believe, doesn't want to play these kids. I'm telling you right now that if Jeff Carter hadn't been hurt, if Achari didn't go on LTIR yesterday, if Nieto hadn't been out for months, I don't know that any of these kids would have seen the light of day. Sam Pullan, a former first-round pick, was called up yesterday, first time all season. Sam's a little bit of a different case here, but hear me out. Sam comes up yesterday, great frame of mind, uh, pretty decent production at the AHL level, huge smile on his face all day, everywhere he went. No one could have known until after warm-ups in which Carter was a participant that Carter was going to be the one who'd get scratched. The common wisdom would have been that Poulin wouldn't play or that Pugliarvi wouldn't play or that Pustin wouldn't play because that's just how it's gone forever. And that's squarely on the head coach, 100% on the head coach. It really is possible, my friends, to have this GM slash coach debate by factoring in both individuals and both of their contributions to this catastrophic season. But what last night showed, or at least it should have shown, to both of those men is that this always was the right way to do this. When we come back, J1Q. Today's J1Q comes from Jake. No, it's not that Jake. His name is Jake Sutton. He says, DK, after seeing how the Penguins looked with some younger legs, maybe Kyle Dubas will realize that, hey, the Penguins could have kept Jake Ensel and brought some of these same younger legs in. I don't know, man. I don't know what he thinks. You know, I, I don't know how he thinks. I don't know that much about him, to be honest with you. The closest I came to picking up his input on anything in recent days was the last night up in the GM's box. Somebody, and I'm going to presume it was him, given ample precedent, was F-bombing like crazy up there at Ricard Raquel over a lousy zone entry. You could hear this throughout the press box. I wasn't exactly eavesdropping, but I, I don't have any idea. I really don't. I don't pretend to be some kind of insider where he's concerned. But I'll reiterate from the opening segment that it defies belief now more than ever, but not just in hindsight, that you would look at the foundation of this roster, Sid, Gino, Latang, Carlson, and say, yeah, yeah, let's add some more 30-year-olds. I could see doing it, and again, this also isn't hindsight because I loved the Lars Eller signing from day one, as longtime listeners can attest. You had to bring in somebody to basically be dad. That was how I referred to Eller last summer. I said they brought in a father figure. Great. So go get a bunch of kids. They don't cost anything. A lot of them are probably already in your system. They don't have to be super crazy skilled. You weren't going to get any goals out of these guys anyway. Look at it that way. Achari, Nieto, I don't even remember who else. I mean, Carter's his, he inherited him, but you didn't have to play him. You weren't going to get any goals anyway. So you might as well have gotten yourself some legs. You might as well have gotten yourself some fire. You might as well have gotten yourself Jonathan Gruden, the fourth-round pick from 2018, 
who's been back and forth across I-80 a hundred times this winter, Gruden goes out for a shift in the third period, and he thinks to himself probably, ah, I'm really, really getting sick of Wilkesbury. Who can I mow down? Oh, there's this guy skating out of the Carolina zone with his head down. Boom. Then he has to answer for it with the fight. Fends for himself with Stefan Nason, who's not really a fighter anyway. Gets everybody all fired up. And I'm thinking to myself, that one shift was more impactful on the team then every shift Achari and Nieto and all these other guys and Carter have taken like all season. It allows the older guys with the talent and everything else to breathe a bit. They don't have to expend all of their energy doing menial labor. They can just be whatever the best version of themselves happens to be in their mid-30s. But the problem, or one of the problems with Sid and Gino in particular, is that they've had to come back 200 feet to get the puck. They're not going to complain about that, but I'll tell you, that's a real, real issue. If they're hanging out up at center red waiting for you know a couple of bang-bang breakout passes, and the other team is worn down a little bit by being forechecked hard all night, the game's different for them. The game's different in that setting. So I, my answer to your question is just to repeat your question. How did they not know this? How did they not know this? I appreciate it. I appreciate everybody listening to Daily Shot of Penguins. We're going to do another one of these tomorrow. Tomorrow.